Welcome back. Today I'm going to be interviewing Lars Madsen. He is a clinical psychologist and also a forensic psychologist. And as some of you know, if you've been following me, um, he works with people with very severe personality disorders, including <coughs> people with psychopathy. So um, you can also check Lars out on his Instagram page at Forensic Clinical Psychology, which has loads of really, really interesting, creative illustrations that are really worth checking out. So, <laughs> Lars. <laughs> thank you very much, Ruth. Thank you for having me on. And uh, no, I'm delighted to be here, <laughs> all the way from yeah. Australia. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for coming. Um, so talk to me. How did you get into working with this population? Uh, um Look, uh, as as the story goes, um, I started doing psychology in the 1990s, and um, I uh, I think at that stage um, I, I got into the fourth year of psychology, and, and you know I was running late for a tutorial, and um, the tutorial was supposed to be where you got delegated, where you ended up um, going for your externship uh, practicum. And when I got there, the only one that that was left was the prison. Um, so I ended up going to the prison, uh, which actually worked out. Okay. I was kind of interested in it. Sorry about that. Um, and um, and um, I uh, started working in a um, what was a, um, a, a a rehabilitation prison um, that that ran groups and things like that. And I was supposed to only be there for about three or four months um and after that i got a, a position to be there for a year which which kind of worked okay and i i started running a group along with a colleague um and they, i had a older mentor there um who who uh, was very supportive and helpful for me and after i um after i i, I finished that year i ended i returned to university completed a clinical master's and then um was able to after that apply for a phd in england where I went um, uh, in Newcastle, and I did my PhD in, in specifically working with um, and managing sex offenders within the community. Um, and whilst I did that, I, I managed to also get work within one of those uh, new units at the time for dang for the management and containment of dangerous and severe personality disorders, which was which was in the early two thousands. Um, so so that was kind of where I started to really um, start to work with. Um, uh, with a severe personality disorder within a forensic context. Um, and, and I stayed there for about seven years and then eventually came back to Australia and, um, and I've, I've worked in sort of a, a role where I've been in private practice within a clinic and, um, and, and also working as a consultant to you know, various government agencies here working with similar kinds of issues um, over, over the time. Um, and, yeah. And what I've found, well, over over the last 10, 13 years is, is um, that I've increasingly just found my, a large portion of my, my, my workload has been working with, with guys who are in, in institutional settings who, who, are, who, who are considered very difficult to manage um, and, uh, and very problematic and very violent. Um, and, um, and my role has, has often been to, to try to engage them, assess them, and also provide guidance to the institution in terms of how, um, how you know, what strategies and, and what approaches might be useful in terms of helping that person be successful in the prison environment. And, and what I mean by that is, is obviously being able to kind of reintegrate and uh, exist, um, you know, for, for their custodial time. Yeah. And I know you're, no, no, like me, you're a schema therapist. Yes. So how would you make sense of, say, someone with psychopathy? So someone who's really lacking in empathy, um, potentially quite cruel towards other people in the pursuit of their goals, maybe someone who's got some element of sadism, those kind of really extreme dangerous behaviours um, that, might be called monsters. Mm. People are really quite dangerous uh, in their behaviours. How would you make sense of that? Yeah. Um, so, so psychopathy. Um, uh, so just to 
to differentiate. Um, so we use the term psychopathy, uh, um, but uh, and um, yeah, it's it's well, okay. Um, there's two types of psychopathy. That's I guess where we'll start. There are two types of psychopathy. There's psychopathy that we know as what would be the prototypical sort of Hollywood movie kind of view of what a psychopath is a, a cold heartless cruel individual uh that has no empathy is is uh, uh um a temperamentally predisposed you know that that is that is something that is um temperamental uh in, inside them uh that has existed from from when they were born like they that you know it's not something that they um you know learned from the environment um it's not something that they um uh, you know, picked up or anything like that. It's something. It's it's a it, it's a it's a a change in in the way that their brain kind of functions and processes information. And these individuals, fortunately, are very rare. Um, uh, these in my in my career working with in institutions, I found that um, um, the majority of of, of uh, so that's the first t- you know type one psychopathy. And the other type of psychopathy is a, is is an individual where that where they probably have some vulnerability to become a little bit psychopathic in in in, in relation to particular kinds of traits of being, you know, callous and um, and 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 cold perhaps, um, but the environment that they grow up in has the effect of amplifying um, their uh, these kinds of traits and problems for them. Um, so these are kind of type two characteristics, type two psychopaths, and they often present in a very dysregulated, um, chaotic kind of way and. Um, uh, you know, can look very much like, um, uh, a, for example, someone who presents with borderline personality disorder, but but they have all these other kind of characteristics that make them very psychopathic as well. Okay, okay so your question was, how do I make sense of, mm. of them? Is that? Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, look, I mean, my, my approach to, psych- to, to, to psychopaths within custody is um, I found that, um, you know, you... You have to understand someone's level of psychopathy when when you start to try to work with someone because I think that makes a real big difference in terms of how you try to engage them, and I think that psychopaths are very. Uh, I think the, the um, type one psychopaths are very uh, very good at being able to spot vulnerability, and they're also very good at being able to be quite manipulative, but they also perhaps have a capacity to be very very business orientated, be orientated to dealing with you know, achieving things for themselves. So with these kinds of individuals, a lot of the time it's about being able to try to work with them in a way to try to identify what it is that they find valuable and what it is that they want, right? Now, in many cases, the, when you work with someone in an institution, they want to get out of there. They want their life to be better. Um, and, um, you know, so why where you, how you try to engage them is, is to sort of assist them with being able to manage to, to engage in therapy, right? This is what which was what we want them to do. We want them to engage in therapy and manage particular kinds of behaviours, and change things about themselves, um, so that they're less harmful and dangerous and risky to other people, um, so, so that they can be progressed. So we want them to change. We want them to engage in therapy. We want to, but we wanted to do do it in a way that actually is meaningful in terms of leading to proper proper change. And I think. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of therapists in the past, or a lot of approaches in the past, have have approached psychopaths from the perspective that we're wanting them to develop empathy, wanting them to develop a better understanding of other people, and that kind of thing. And in many cases, that's for, for these guys, that's just not possible. They're not going to do that. They don't, you know, they, they just don't function in this in in that kind of way. So. Um, a, a, you know, having that kind of expectations of, of them, I found early on in my career, you kind of en- end up playing this game where they're trying to convince you that they're having empathy, but you kind of get a sense where well, it just doesn't hit the mark. You know, so you're feeling all manipulated, manipulated, and they're being dishonest. And I think that once we can recognise that, well, you're never going to have empathy, or at least not very good empathy, um, and and maybe that's okay. What what we want you to do is actually just stop this behavior. We want to stop you to be violent, stop you being violent, stop you exploiting people, stop you hurting people. And that's what we want. And you can do that effectively without having to have empathy. You can be very much focused on, on what your own, what, what your needs are. Um, so with these guys, you approach them like a business proposal. You say, okay, well, you know, you want to progress in the prison. Well, this is what we need you to do. And 
I don't need you to to feel empathy or to be compassionate towards other people because that's a bridge too far for these guys. But we need you to change your behaviours. We need you to change what you do. Uh, and and that's that's very different to say with a with a client where who who has the capacity for empathy and 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 has perhaps a, a you know an internal in, an inner world that is very very different to to highly psychopathic individuals. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. How is it different between, say, the factor one and factor two psychopaths? Type one, type two. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, a lot of the guys who present with type two psychopathy also have all these borderline characteristics, so they're very emotionally dysregulated. So your engagement with them a lot of the time is also helping them kind of regulate their sort of their, their you know, dysregulation. Um, I think with these guys as well, I mean, I... I also, they, they, they feel a lot and they're, they're traumatized. Um, but there is a, there, there is a greater, there is some capacity, certainly in my experience. And, and I think within some of the literature shown that for them to be able to form attachments, meaningful attachments and connections to people, which, which is absent from the type one, uh, individuals. Yeah. So you can work with them a little bit more like you would work a, a regular clinical client um, and, and form a, a more, perhaps a more robust and genuine um, a rapport and connection with them. Yeah. How does, say, the schema therapy model come into play with, with this kind of population? You might need to go right back to basics and explain the schema model. Yeah. Um, so the schema, schema therapy, um, very simply put, um, is uh, is a model that it, that proposes that as people grow up um, and exist in the world, in addition to sort of physical needs, we also have emotional needs, and um, these emotional needs, if they get met or not get met in our childhood or when they grow up, um, can can create emotional wounds if they don't get met or we're traumatized in some kind of way, and that can look in those those emotional wounds can manifest in a particular way. Um, so, for example, if someone has suffered a lot of um, uh, trauma or physical abuse uh, in their childhood, they may grow up with an experience of feeling quite mistrusting uh, of other people. We call that maybe the mistrust and abuse schema. And that emotional wound acts as a, as a type of tripwire for them in their life. And when they go forward, whenever they get close to people, they start to feel um, a sense of mistrust and, and, and uh, you know, perhaps anxiety getting close to people. Um, so these schemas form in, in early childhood and then kind of sort of manifest in a person's life going forward. And we develop uh, ways of coping with these, with these emotional wounds uh, through the development of what's called uh, coping modes. And coping modes are, um, well, they're that. They, they're, they're ways that we try to, to deal with emotional um, uh, pain um, and the way we try to deal with an environment that might feel, um, uh, you know, chaotic or dangerous for us. And there are usually, there's maybe three or four different kinds of modes. There's uh, what we call child modes. Modes is, that's where we feel the stuff, feel uh, our, our pain. And then there's the avoidant modes, uh, which are around not feeling stuff. Uh, and then there's the overcompensating modes, which is about getting on top. Um, and then there's what we call parent modes, which are sort of the internalized uh, critic dialogues that that can that, that a lot of clients um, experience and, and and have within themselves. Within um, my forensic clients, a lot of them have all. I would say the vast majority of them have had horrible childhoods. Uh, we know, um, you know, many many folks who have end up with severe personality disorder diagnoses. Have had horrible childhoods. They they were suffered tremendous abuse and problems from a very very young age, and they have all kinds of emotional wounds or schemas that are relevant for them. And in reaction to that, they've developed all these coping modes. Um, uh, and these coping modes we make sense of because th they are the sides of them that actually are related to their problematic behaviour in their adulthood in their, in their life. Now, within um, uh, the forensic population, what we what we what we will see is that there are certain kinds of coping modes which are very get, can get very very big. Um, so we'd call them. Uh, there's the um, the bully and attack mode, which is a mode that is around um, 
dominating and using coercion as a way of get int intimidation to get your needs met. There's a conning manipulator mode, which is a, 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 um, a, a state of mind where a, a person might use manipulation and deception as a way of getting their needs met. There's a self-aggrandizer, which is a person that kind of puts, which is a, you know, not a person, but a side of an individual where they put themselves on top of everybody else. A predator, which is a cold, calculated um, uh, type of mode, which is very much focused on um, taking people out or hurting someone or getting rid of, of someone that is regarded as a threat. Um, and there's a paranoid over controller mode. That's the other, other um, significant um, mode within forensic populations, which is around um, uh, being very suspicious and, and controlling of the environment, and and uh, uh, and, and watching for threats, and um, uh, and, and can, you know using using paranoia as a way of kind of being able to spot threats now. And these, um, I mean, David Bernstein and colleagues in, in Holland were the ones who first kind of started to apply schema therapy to forensic populations. And uh, that was done in the mid 2000s, late 2000s, late 2000s. Um, and, uh, and it was him and, and, and his innovative colleagues that were able to apply the therapy to it and also discover these, these dominant sort of overcompensating modes that exist perhaps more so within forensic populations than perhaps the regular clinical populations, although they, they still do. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I, I'm thinking because I'm thinking, what do I see working a lot with people with cluster B personality disorders, typically narcissistic personality and borderline um, for me, but, you know, I see the self-aggrandizing mode in people with um, kind of narcissistic tendencies and I wonder if the kind of bully and attack mode is maybe, is it a more extreme version of like an angry protector mode? Yeah, yeah. Um, the bully and attack mode a lot of the time, like it is, is about using intimidation and coercion mm. and violence if necessary to get, to get mm. something, right? So they're on the front foot. They're like wanting you to do something um, for them and, um and, and it's it's a strategy deployed yeah. to, to achieve that so you know it might look if, if i was a client and you 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 were you know my my therapist and i'm wanting you to write a report i might say well ruth let me tell you you know you better write this report for me properly or else you know you know what's going to happen okay you know so i'm you know not yelling and not punching you, not doing anything like that, but I'm giving, I'm being very threatening and intimidating. So I'm in a bully and attack mode in, as a way of trying to yeah. coerce you to get something yeah. that I want. Right? So that's very yeah. different to say uh, an angry protector, which is about trying to keep people at a distance, um, uh, you know, because you don't want them to, you, you know, talk, you know, you, you don't want them to ask you questions maybe about how, how you might be feeling or, or expose your vulnerability. Yeah. yeah. And how would it be different from, say, an enraged, angry child mode? Well, yeah. So that's a very good question. So an enraged, angry child mode is the, the fundamental premise or experience of it for the client is, um, is a sense of injustice and unfairness. So it feels, I think, a lot of the times when clients, are in, and, and a lot of my forensic clients do have a very large angry child and enraged child mode. So when they get triggered, they often feel it's really, really unfair and they get really angry about it. So it's, it's like for them, the experience is this of feeling that, uh, you know, they're throwing a tantrum. You know, they feel it inside. There's a sense of injustice. They're not being treated fairly and it's all wrong and they're so angry about it and they've just had enough. So, so, so the internal experience and the manifestation of it is, is often to communicate this unfairness um, and, and, and do it in a perhaps a temper tantrum, chaotic kind of way, which is very different to say like the, the bullying and attack mode where there's control right it it is it is on top it's the mode where the person feels on top and um you know they're not out of control there's not a sense of injustice it's deployed to to achieve or gain something yeah yeah these are modes that i don't typically see much in private practice mm -hmm. i recognize them i used to work in inpatient 
and was not in forensic, but I was in um, kind of secure, um, like psychiatric intensive care. And we would get some forensic patients. And that's exactly the kind of modes that I would have seen on occasion Absolutely. in that setting. But I think it's very different from, I suppose, what I'm doing, which is probably the more average person with narcissistic or borderline traits or even the full personality disorder, but who are not engaging in criminally offensive behavior. Mm, mm. In a way that, that Although I would suggest that, that those clients probably do have them, but they have a tempered down version of it maybe as well. And, um, you know, so instead of being 10 out of 10, it, it's it's like four or yeah. three, but yeah. it's still there, I think, for, for a lot of those clients, particularly the, um, I think, uh, well, uh, yeah, I mean, narcissistic clients often can, you know, they obviously have a very big self-aggrandizement, putting themselves... That one, in, I see. Yeah, and, and they can have a bit of an angry child mode as well that, you know, when they get hurt or, you know, people, you know, they, they feel shame or, or defectiveness or that. Um, the, the, the thing with a lot of the clients that I work with, they who, who present with, with those uh, modes, like a narcissistic uh, um, personality disorder, a lot of these guys also have some of the, the the bully and attack and the predator and the conning manipulator modes, which make them that which make it much more of an antisocial kind of flavor, where those mo- modes are deployed as a way to you know break rules, to be in control, to gain power back, to hurt people, to to dominate a situation or a set of circumstances. And this is not what I think, but it's what a lot of people would say: is are they monsters? Are they just bad, evil people? Yeah, look, I mean, th- that is um, uh, something, you know, that, that that's pushed out through the media all the time, isn't it? And the movies. Um, no, 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 they're not. I mean, I think um, I've had, um, as, as I said, I think a lot of clients that, that um come into forensic context, the, the vast majority of them have had horrible childhoods and they've been let down and hurt and abused when they were very, very young. And in a sense, they've learned to develop these sides of themselves that are actually about keeping themselves safe and, and, and surviving in the world and getting on in the world. And it's like, um, you know, and often when you start back there, you know, then, you know, and you get into the criminal justice system, certainly here in Australia, and I imagine it's the same you know, elsewhere, you know, it's hard to sometimes turn them off, you know, because once you get into the jail system, you know, it is a bit of a doggy dog kind of world. Uh, and if you're not, if you're too vulnerable and you're too easy, then then you're going to be exploited by other guys who, who want to be, you know, on top. Um, and, you know, so they get caught in these horrible cycles where they almost have to, you know, they, they can't turn these modes off because they live in a world where the world is it's so dangerous uh, that if they allow themselves to be vulnerable and try to go a different path, then, um, you know, they're really at risk of being hurt and, and attacked. And, and, you know, because in, in the, these environments, you know, memories are long and grudges are held. And, um, uh, you know, and it's hard to sort of get out of that. So they're not monsters um, uh, at all. Uh, they're often um, they often want the, th- the same things that that normal people want, which is, you know, to be cared about and to to have meaning and purpose in in in, in your life, and and to be valued and respected by other people. Um, um, yeah. So in, in many cases, that's that's you know that's that's the case for a lot of clients when you get when you get down to it, but it's, but it's, it, it, it's very tricky to, to get out of that web when I think they, the longer you spend in it for, for clients who, who have for big forensic histories. Yeah. Well, I'm also imagining in a prison system, you probably need some of those overcompensating modes to oh, survive. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 You know, you can't go soft and vulnerable in a, and that's jail. one of the tricky things with, with doing therapy in, 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 um, institutional correctional settings is that a lot of guys have like you know um, sides of themselves which are the tough guy uh, the, the guy that doesn't feel or, or, or the you know the you know the part the, the guy that can sort of you know be a little bit manipulative that kind of thing just to survive and, and just to be left alone and and, and and that kind of thing. so it's um, 
it's very functional in that environment. The problem is that, you know, they, it, it's hard to get out of that environment and come into the real world, into the, you know, the normal community world and, and start to have relationships with people because those things just become behavioral scripts that become so easily activated at the slightest thing. And, uh, and what also happens, you know, when a lot of these guys sort of make the transition or try to reintegrate reintegrate back into the community and, and and they might genuinely want to just put all this stuff behind them and have done this therapy but you know then you know often a lot of the times they're not accepted back into the community they they are labeled as monsters they are excluded they are um you know not given uh, opportunities and chances and 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 many of them also will have um you know sometimes really um uh, you know things about them that make them look very very different um from from drug use for instance uh that the the physical toll that it takes the fights that um the physical toll of fighting you know these uh, you know prison tattoos and, and ridiculous tattoos on the face and hands and neck and everything like that i mean it it makes people um you know stand out you know when they're trying to sort of put all this stuff behind them that also leads them to be you know perhaps target of exclusion and 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 you know other kinds of um, perhaps discrimination because of that. So it, it makes it very hard to leave it behind. Um, uh, yeah, I guess it's it's an interesting one. I think because you know when I work with sort of people with NPD and the kind of discourse around NPD is you must go no contact, cut these people from your life. They're toxic individuals. You cannot have a good relationship with someone who's a narcissist. And I think. On the one hand, I think absolutely people need to keep themselves safe. If someone's being abusive, being, if someone's abusive to you, if someone is hurting you, then absolutely the boundary might be you don't get to spend time with me. But at the same time, the only way I think for someone with these kinds of patterns to have meaningful change is in relationship because they're relational, the traumas are relational. So the recovery has to be relational. So how do you, how do you do that? How do you in your work help facilitate a different context for people or facilitate change within the context that they're in, which may not be ideal by any stretch of the imagination? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think within using schema therapy, what what we will in therapy have done is be able to kind of make sense of the independent of the person's modes so they will have an understanding of the different sides of themselves that that exist you know um they will have a you know the uh, bully and attack mode or self-aggrandizer mode and 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 they'll have vulnerable modes that feel self they'll have a drug you know detached self-soother mode or a drug using mode perhaps as well and, uh, and we'll start to be able to understand how how big these modes are in their day to day um, and, and very rarely is, you know, when, when you're describing someone who's just full on NPD and, and I mean, very rarely are these clients completely all the time in self-aggrandizer mode. Um, I think that they, they're there sometimes and when they're feeling that need or they're feeling not good enough or there's that shame that's been activated then this self-aggrandizer might get super big. But, but generally, when you work with someone and seeing someone over a period of time, you, you know, they, they won't always be in that mode. And, and, you know, you would hope that you will be able to have help them be able to have some insight into the different sides of themselves and how these things function in, rea in reaction to and in response to each other. And I mean, what you ultimately want to be trying to do is to 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 heal the, the emotional wounds that that kind of um, activate the need to sort of be on top and be special and be entitled. Um, because if those that side of that person is heal, healed, then the need for this becomes much less. Um, and it's much easier to be uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a sort of more healthy adult mode, as we would call it, where you can relate in a more reciprocal way with other people. So, so how you work with people is help them help them recognize this, help them understand their prior patterns and help them heal some of these, 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 these wounds that kind of, that drive this so that they are able to, um, 
and not re- need to rely or draw upon these overcompensating modes that, that are so destructive and harmful to their relationships. And obviously also help them develop better ways of being empathic and understanding and, and reciprocal in relationships. And do you work with family members, partners, people who are close to them? Yeah, yeah, sometimes. I mean, usually when I end up working with uh, family members or partners, it's um, uh, it's usually in the context of they've been through they've been through some kind of criminal justice process. They've they've done some crime. They've uh, they have um, uh, you know uh, been through the media and that kind of thing. And they've been they'll have done a chunk of therapy um, and they'll have made some kind of progress in therapy and. Um, and I say to, to, to clients a lot of the time when we're going through therapy, particularly when we're starting therapy, when we're trying to make sense of why this happened, is that we need to be able to make sense of why this happened and understand it and make uh, the ununderstandable understandable so that, so that not only can we understand it so that we can un- you know, prevent it from happening again, that makes sense, right? But also so they are able to have genuine and authentic conversations with their family and their partners and people that they love so that they can help them understand how they got to this point, whatever that that point might have been in, in terms of their offending. Because a lot of, you know, people in the community, you know, who are the family members of, of uh, perpetrators uh, of whatever, you know, can have the perception that, you know, they, they, they're a monster you know, this is, this is horrible, you know, they're never going to change. Um, and, and, you know, that, that in many cases isn't true or, or that they're crazy. Um, you know, again, in many cases, it's not true. Um, so they have difficulty being able to understand and make sense of why this happened. Like, how did this happen? And I think that uh, a first step in being able to heal relationships with partners and family and others is being able to uh, provide a, an authentic and uh, understandable um, uh, explanation for how they ended up in this situation. And that involves them in many cases being quite vulnerable, talking about their own um, trauma and, and how they may perhaps try to deal with it uh, in their life and that, that put them on the path to um, you know whatever it is that they ended up doing, so so in that situation, that's usually when I've worked with partners is is having um, worked with someone independently for a long period of time. They have a family member that they're trying to reconcile with, they are, and and they want to bring them into therapy to to have them um, be able to talk to me and ask me questions about um, about the person um, and and. And, and and express their concerns and and uh, be able to kind of you know um, talk to someone who understands what's happened and and give them sort of perhaps accurate information in terms of, 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 of you know the circumstances and the, and the risk and that type of thing for the yeah. future and some people will say is that just making excuses how is it different well, I don't know whether it's making excuses. I mean, many of the cases, um, individuals, when they when they get to that point, it, it's it, it, in a sense we need to be. You know, what we're doing is not saying that it's because of the drugs. We're not saying it's because you had a bad childhood. What we're trying to do, in many cases, is to try to understand if you had a dysfunctional or traumatic childhood, how did you end up? in this situation like what uh, is a sequence of events how did you choose to cope with that and in many cases people will you know in situations will, will struggle with trauma and, and distress they will they will uh, develop drug addiction uh, as a way of managing symptoms and, and feeling uh, not those kinds of symptoms not feeling that stuff they'll be in a world where where it's dangerous and unsafe so they develop sides of themselves to be manipulative to hurt other people to stand on to make sure that you're never vulnerable, you know, so you, you can see logically how someone who has been traumatized can develop these problems and then develop sides of themselves that actually are quite dangerous, that, you know, that, that initially started perhaps as a way of trying to feel safe, but have 
become so big and dominant that it's actually, you know, really harmful to other people and dangerous, um, you know, to themselves and other people in many cases. So it's not, I mean, I don't see it as making excuses. I see it as being able to, to understand the trajectory of how things got to where they were. It doesn't mm-hmm. make it okay, of course. I mean, people go through trauma all the time and have, and don't do that, right? Um, but it, it's kind of a moot point because in, in many cases, when people are at this stage in their life or in their therapy, then, you know, they need to have some way of being able to move forward. They need to have some way of being able to kind of see themselves as redeemable, I think, to be able to, uh, you know, go in a better path and um, uh, and being, you know, you know, I think that's a very important part of the process in in their re- their rehabilitation. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, to me, that's also... I think being able to have that explanation for yourself that's realistic and it's not, oh, well, it wasn't my fault. It was like, no, it wasn't your fault that you went through the trauma, but the responsibility for the actions is yours. Yeah, absolutely. And you have to really wrestle with that and be able to have an explanation that makes sense and that hopefully also helps guide you as to how can you prevent something like this happening again? How can you develop healthier ways of relating to people? How can you intentionally do that? I think it's really important. I think it's also very brave for someone who struggles with vulnerability, which I'm sure all of these guys that you work with do, to yeah. bring a partner or a family member in. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's it's. It's a hugely uh, stressful and frightening experience for them. Um, yeah. But it, it's one that um, I think in, in many cases, when they get into that point, it's, you know, they, um, it's almost like they, you know, they, they have bared their soul, you know, like it is, it is, it is, um, um, you know, nothing, nothing is off the table in terms of just being able to open up and, and be vulnerable. In, in this issue because they don't know how it's going to go either i guess obviously i don't know what i'm going to say <laughs> i don't know well you know i try to prompt them and help them w- with with reassuring them but i mean you know it, it could it could go much worse yeah, yeah. And i think um just on the note about that idea of being able to to um explain it and understand it like a lot of a lot of guys who have have done horrible things often don't forgive themselves either. They often think of themselves as monsters, you know. And a part of the therapy when you work with someone over the long term is that when you kind of break through their sort of not feeling modes and their overcompensating modes, they often get to a point where they then kind of, you know, they 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 kind of have some kind of realization that you know how how could anyone look at me or love me or care about me or think kindly of me because of what I've done? Like I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm obviously such a monster, you know. And and that becomes an issue to struggle with in therapy because that becomes also, a, a, you know, a point where, you know, w- what's the point of change? Why 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 continue on this path if 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 this is what I am? if I can't be any more than that and um, why not just continue to live my life dominating others and and taking drugs and um, being in control and being on top. Um, That's a very helpless position. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very external locus of control. I can't do this. I have no power over this. I'm a victim of my own innate nature. Yeah. Yeah. And that doesn't sit right easily with me no 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 for someone no. to take that position no 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 it, it, it not at all it's, it's not helpful at all it's just more of the same yeah it's, it's about being able to get through that and that's that's a and that is a process for many cases for for, for them being able to 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 kind of get through that process and and understand themselves and understand their history uh i think it you know, and schema therapy really helps with that, I think. Um, and it helps them. I wouldn't say forgive themselves. I don't think, you know, that's the right term, but it, it, it sort of helps them have a more nuanced understanding of their own vulnerabilities as a, as a human being and, um, and how they ended up 
in this life, really. Do you think change is possible? Absolutely. And what does it look like? What does it look like? What does successful therapy with a with, psychopathic yeah. offender look like? Psychopathic offender. Look, um, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I, I, I think it's 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 very very hard, and I think it's it's different to to working in, in clinical context because there are institutional and social barriers that get in the way of of just kind of being able to sort of shift gears and and, and move into a new life. But I mean, in a, in a lot of um, I mean, a lot of guys end up offending or have lived an offending life, um, often aren't, you know, aren't happy, aren't fulfilled. I mean, they're always, um, you know, they're always having to live in a world where, you know, it's dangerous, it's unsafe, they need to be on top, they need to be secretive, they need to be dominant, they need to look out for this person, they can't trust this person or that person. And the relationships they have with everyone else is so brittle and, and, and quite superficial, I think. So it's an exhausting world to have to live in. Um, and, uh, you know, so I think being able to tone down the, the overcompensating modes, um, I think is, is very liber liberating for them. And, and what does change look like? Well, for a lot of these guys, it looks like that. It looks like being able to step out of that world, turn down the overcompensating modes and, and be able to engage their relationships and and their 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 world in ways that helps them get their needs met, um, in ways that doesn't need them sort of to have to reoffend or, or engage in, in in those kinds of behaviors. So, yeah, um, in many cases, it doesn't look change doesn't look spectacular. It's small. It's uh, having a job. It's uh, having a relationship. It's going to church. It's uh, being able to hold down a flat and um, uh, a lead, you know, have a garden in, in the backyard, that kind of thing uh, for a lot of these guys. Being able to go That's to big. the university. Huh? I mean, those are big. <laughs> yeah, you know, if you've grown are. up in highly chaotic environments and the kind of, but there's criminality going on around you to actually have a peaceful life. Where you have your own place, and you're holding down a relationship, and you're holding down a job. I mean, that's massive. Yeah, yeah. I've had a few clients who who we saw at the clinic for quite a few years, for so about ten years. He, um, uh, his name was Walter, and he um, he'd done some very. He'd come from a very difficult background, and um, had done some really brutal rapes uh, in his early twenties, and been inside for a very long time. And got now done schema therapy for about um, six or six or seven years. Anyway, um, he he did really well, and um, and you know he came in in the last couple of years. So he finished therapy about five years ago. In the last couple of years, he actually came in just to say hi, and. Uh, he um, he used to always say he used to always say when he was coming in he says you know what I've changed because I've joined AA and I was like well, what do you mean AA and he was like altered attitude Lars altered attitude um, AA altered attitude um, and he he came in a couple of years ago and he said look he just bought his second car you know he bought his second car he'd had a job as uh, a detailer. Um, and he'd saved up. It was the first time he'd, he'd saved up his money. He's in his 50s, right? He'd saved up his money from his car detailing job, which was hard and long, and uh, and bought a new car. And he came in to say, hey, I just wanted to let you know and show you guys. And, I mean, life was still complicated and, and, and hard, but he wasn't back inside, and he was trying to be functional and healthy in the way he approached the world. Mm-hmm. It says something about his connection to you, mm, yeah, and his relationship with you. What's it, what's it like for you to, I suppose, open yourself up? Because I think in schema therapy, we do get close to our clients. I get quite attached to the people I work with. You know, you're really rooting for them. What is that like? Yeah, for you to get close to people? Um, look, I, I I find that um, uh, I, I've seen some clients for. Um, for, for for over ten years now, and um, yeah, you do get attached to them. I I find 
it's it's um uh you know how is it it's uh like i think early on in my career is it was you know you were much more um i think conscious of trying to maintain boundaries i'm not saying that you don't maintain boundaries now but i think that as you that as i've gotten older and become more confident in in myself and the therapy i've been able to feel be more genuine and authentic with with guys and and uh, will you know um i think have quite genuine and authentic relationships with them and that's important because you need to be honest and sometimes being honest is is difficult for you know because it's not always what they want to hear but i um you know i, I certainly find that i have gotten um very much attached to 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 many of my clients and many of my clients after they finish their jail time they still come back and see me and they'll come back and you know just drop in you know pay for their sessions this time and uh, you know catch up just to let me know what's going on uh, which is which is really which is really nice i found that with clients this is e even some of the the most highly psychopathic clients i've i've worked with i've you know formed close bonds with them and and it's it's um because i've seen them for such a long time and it's sometimes been very very interesting to see how um uh, you know how when you f terminate or you finish up with them uh, and how they respond to that and, and and some of them have you know gotten quite emotional and I've been quite surprised by that you know um, because I thought you know you're not supposed to be feeling attached so this is weird um, but 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 I think um, I think that's a really important part of of, of I think schema therapy is, is being that authentic genuine stable committed you know attachment and and it's it's an important part and it's interestingly for for folks who might work with psychopathic clients the more psychopathic a client is the longer you work with them the less psychopathic they feel for you <laughs> and uh, there's some research around that saying that they be the theory is that uh, they become very good at reading you and 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 uh, um, knowing how to manipulate you that might be true um but but i've certainly noticed that with with my highly psychopathic clients that i have felt a greater rapport with them after longer i've seen them and thought of them less psychopathic even though they clearly have been very very psychopathic um and i've been sort of do you think they, do you think that's the case are they becoming less psychopathic or are they getting better at appearing so to you yeah look i um I would like to think that they're becoming less psychopathic, but I'm I'm driven by the data, and I and, the, and there's a part of me that thinks that um, you know, like like as long in, in my role and my status with them, a lot of the time I I I have something to give. I'm an important person in their life in many cases, so so I'm I'm primed for you know you know for conning and and being you know uh, manipulated for for their purposes, you know. Um, and that's why, you know, in my role, like, obviously, you know, I wouldn't, I would, I would work with someone therapeutically, but I wouldn't then also be the person assessing them and evaluating them because, you know, the, the, my judgment around those kinds of things would get affected by, you know, these kinds of uh, experiences. Um, I, I think for some of them, maybe they, they become, they, they have their first experience in some cases of someone who, who's there with them, works with them over a long period of time, is consistent, authentic, um, uh, warm, uh, uh, perhaps helpful. I think that that offers them maybe an experience, I think, that they've never had before. It's always been maybe uh, a world where, you know, it's a, you know, you've got to always, you know, people are trying to exploit you at every, every angle. Um, so I think that th there might be some, some some truth in the idea that 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 for some individuals that that is very powerful uh and and uh and meaningful and i, and I certainly think that with some of my clients that, that has been the case and then i think that there have been a few other clients where i thought that was the case but i realized afterwards that you no know, it was just all a sham it was all a sham yeah. so yeah and i'm also thinking about you know, I think about the people you work with when they realise what they've done is pretty terrible, that they've 
done something that's been profoundly damaging, hurtful to other people um, and how they make peace with that. And I'm thinking about can the rest of us, so people who are not criminal, take something from the work that you do that would be helpful about dealing with our own more difficult sides or our own mm. our own narcissism or our own coldness, our own cruelty on occasion. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, like I think that, I think that uh, I find it's, it's, it's helpful, I think, to see, I, I find that it's helpful to sort of recognise that we have all these qualities within ourselves. And I think that um, the, the difference, I think, between people who are in the clinical realm, maybe even in the forensic realm, is that they have more of a healthy adult uh, side to them. Um, I think um, I think it's 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 yeah I mean I think what well, yeah like like um, I'll tell you a little story um, a few years ago actually um, I, I experienced um, when I was working I think I was burnt out I started to experience really quite intrusive violent thoughts um, in response to um, you know into my work and these would just sort of pop up for me, you know, innocuously. And they were just violent thoughts about, you know, a, a person, a, a nondescript person. And I started to think, well, what's this about? Like, I don't really know. I don't really, am I, am I traumatized? Am I, you know, and I, I listened to a lot of horrible stuff. And I started to realize that um, my violent thoughts were actually linked to my sense of feeling helpless in the situation that I was in in my workplace and I'd been working somewhere where you know it was just very demanding and it was a huge grind and, and and you didn't get appreciated and all those kinds of things and and what I noticed is that these violent thoughts would pop into my head almost as a way of compensating for these feelings of helplessness right and and I guess that for me what I realized then you know and I, I made the link to think well you know like like why the violent thoughts well well there's something about them that actually felt powerful, felt strong, felt on top or something like that, right? Um, and uh, I've never been violent. I'm not a violent person at all, I assure you. Um, but there was something about how this happened just very implicitly and automatically, you know, uh, and almost like unconsciously. And it's only sort of when I started to pry and, and question and, and ask myself, what's going on here? What's this about? And I guess that what I realized then is, uh, I think, and, and this is helpful maybe for, for other uh, clients or, or people in the clinical realm is, you know, if we, you know, these kinds of uh, impulses when they become big or when they become strong, like I don't, I don't think of them as, uh, I think that they're related to something, you know, they're, they're related to some need perhaps that isn't getting met. And it, it, it might not be a need to destroy and crush people, but it might be, it might be some kind of antidote for the experience of feeling, you know, helpless or, or weak or vulnerable or scared or something like that. And I think that by being able to start to make that link, then these thoughts it actually kind of dissolved. You know, it just sort of stopped. It's sort of like once you start to recognize it and label it, you go, okay, oh, that's what's going on. Now I get it. All right. Well, then what I really need to do here is actually something else. Um, and, and then that just kind of, you know, became irrelevant or dissolved, but that had all happened at a very sort of unconscious level. I think it was only after I started to just tune in what's going on here in my, in my own thinking that, that I became aware of it. And I think that that probably happens. Um, I think that happens for people all the time, you know, I think that, oh, sure. um, uh, that, you know, and, and, and I think people fear it and, and, and think of themselves and judge themselves harshly because of it. But, but I think that actually, you know, um, we, we have these, these sides to ourselves that, that to, a lesser, to, to, to a larger or lesser degree that um, I think, um, you know, are, are ways that we try to problem solve things at an unconscious level um, to feel differently maybe. I, I think those are the sides that we can really look at, mm. um, you know, for 
I see it a lot with kind of, I mean, I work a lot with people who've been in quite abusive relationships and the revenge fantasies come mm. up a lot. It's like oh, yeah. I could get him, get revenge. How could I get revenge? And, um, you know, I always kind of like, well, you know, there's something really interesting underneath this fantasy. You know, that, I see that. That is the overcompensating mode. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and you're not going to act on it. I'm, I'm not Every- worried. I'm- yeah, yeah, true. And the revenge, that, that's absolutely the vengeance fantasies is that that is so much that is so much linked to the to sadism, right? It's it's that that um, uh, and, and and a lot of clients, you know, when they have those vengeful fantasies, in my experience, they, they 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 almost kind of revel in that sense of power, because if you ask them, how are you feeling in that moment? What's going on for you emotionally speaking? Well, when they're in that sadistic fantasy thinking process, they're actually feeling good. They're feeling powerful. It feels that, good. It feels good yeah. to it, and um, you know. Uh, and why are you doing it? Well, because it feels good, you know. Um, and yeah, it's... but then it's also exhausting, and it dominates your mind, and it agitates your body system, and it's not a very nice way to live for any length of time. To be in that kind of vengeful, and it goes anger. like it goes. Like it, it can, oh, wait, fortunately, hopefully it doesn't go anywhere, but it, but it really can go, can go, um, uh, you know, like it just goes round and round and round and round and it doesn't yeah. actually address the underlying pain or, or, or distress, I think, that, um, that, that might be kind of feeding it. It's very ruminative. I mean, for the, I mean, I'm thinking of the people I work with, not forensic populations, I'm, you know, someone's talking about revenge fantasies and the vast majority of the cases, I'm not about to pick up the phone and call the police and get worried about any offending behaviour. The problem is the, the ruminative cycle that just goes round and round and leaves them just wound up and yeah. agitated. But exactly. there is something in the fantasy that feels good. Yeah. And I'm, that's really interesting to explore and to look at. And I think that's in all of us. I don't think anyone's immune from that. Mm, 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 mm. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, Ruth. Yeah, and I mean, I mean, I I find that um, uh, you know when I interview guys about those fantasy processes, I often ask, "What are you looking at? Like, what are you specifically looking at and for when they kind of go over in my mind?" And um, and it's interesting. Like a lot of people, it'll be they'll be focusing on one or two aspects in relation to that fantasy that is particularly powerful it might be the sense of 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 just being able to be so dominant over another person or, or the person that they you know have dispute with or it might um you know in some cases it, it it's actually on on the on the pain and suffering in the other individual you know so they they will sort of focus in on the facial um uh, expressions and um you know, the body language in their fantasy, that will be the kicker for them. Um, yeah. Oh. But I think that, um, I think if, if having a, a recognition and an understanding that these things are normal um, to a, by and large to, is, is a really useful thing. And being curious about them, not, not, not in the sense of, well, you know, how do I torture and kill someone, but in a sense, well, what's this really about? What's, what's going on? What's, what's it in response to i think is is i think really valuable for people and i think valuable for 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 people that might be troubled by it you know um, and i think most people you know will will have some degree of being troubled by these kinds of thoughts if they're sort of very um dominant or, or, or preoccupation for them yeah is there anything you think we should cover that we haven't covered Oh, um, I don't know. <laughs> I think I don't know. I seem to cover a lot. What do you think, Ruth? Have we covered a lot? Are we? I don't think so. I mean, I had a few thing, things written down that I kind of wanted to cover, but I think questions from people that uh, that wanted to that we haven't asked or addressed. I mean, I guess it's we haven't really explicitly said it, but I think it's implicit in so much of what you say is is about kind of seeing the offending behavior, really making sense of it and understanding it is absolutely consistent with having compassion for victims. Oh, yeah. Because I think that's something that 
some people will find jarring listening to this. They're thinking, particularly if they've been a victim yeah. of someone's offending behaviour, where they will see you and almost feel like it's a betrayal. Like, how mm. can you go and give so much care to these guys? Mm. 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 Um, yeah, yeah, okay. Let me say something about that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, okay. All right. So I guess when I work with these men, um, and they're usually men, the the ultimate goal and objective is actually to assist them to be able to reintegrate into the community without hurting any more anyone else and um being able to live their life in a way that is um uh, that is meaningful but doesn't harm themselves or other people again and um whilst there is a lot of focus on helping people heal their trauma in therapy uh, and understand their background and, and be compassionate and kind. Um, the primary objective is to reduce the person's risk to the community. That's, that's the objective. Um, and what we found is that um, being compassionate and kind and, and helping that person be able to resolve and deal with their problems in a way that is effective for them or that alleviates that in some way actually does make them less dangerous to everybody else in the community. And um, so <clears throat> it would be, um, it wouldn't be possible to just address the risk and the dangerousness without having some degree of compassion and care to, to do that. Um, and it's been tried. You know, we've tried the uh, um, uh, rehabilitation processes where, you know, it's about shame and and and, um, and so on and so forth, and and, and blaming and anger and, and and putting them in their place and educating them about the consequences. And that stuff doesn't work. It doesn't work in the way that we need it to work. But schema therapy, forensic schema therapy, is a um, modality that in a, that has been shown in a, in a recent uh, peer-reviewed double-blind study published by Bernsey and colleagues to, to be effective in, in helping um, people who have this kind of background and um, be able to um, be uh, released from institutions and prisons and able to function in the community in a way that isn't uh, harmful or dangerous to other people. Yeah. <clears throat> and do you want to plug your course that's coming up? Yes, yes, yes. Because yes. I'm going to, I'll probably do it. Oh, I, cool. I hope you do. I hope you do. It'll, it'll be a great. It's a great course. It's um, the course. Uh, I'm. I've recently, with my colleague Shay Addison, we've designed a six-week online training course called A Hero's Journey, the Forensic Schema Sessions. We've called it. Um, and <clears throat> and what we what I uh, what we wanted to do with these uh, um, videos uh, was a couple of things. One is, in a lot of my supervision uh, sessions with uh, colleagues, I mean, many people will say, "Well, what do you do? What does it look like? How do you use schema mode cards? How do you how do you deal with a conning manipulator mode? How do you, you know, you know, if the guy's in bullying attack, what do you do? What do you say? How does that work? How does it look like?" Um, so we wanted to really kind of take some some key uh, moments in therapy from the beginning to the middle to the end and kind of try to show uh, what actually happens in the therapy room. Um, and um, so the so it's not lectures as such, although Shay analyzes, explains what's going on in each clip. So you get an, an explanation and an overview of that, but then you get the clip of me with an actor sort of acting out a scene um, uh, a typical a scene uh, uh, within a forensic kind of context, um, and look, I I, uh, I think it's a really um, you know of course I'd say that right, but I, I think it looks pretty cool. Not I haven't done it like the, the director did did a fantastic job. The guy who did the filming and and the actor was really really excellent as well. Um, but but it um, if you're interested in this kind of stuff and how it works and what it looks like, then this would be something um, I, check it out. A hero's journey. 
the forensic schema sessions um, and they I will send Ruth a a, a poster of it <laughs> so you can when find it's ready I will also put a link in the description of this video oh wonderful as soon as it's right so it might not be there straight away but when it's available I'll put it in the description yeah cool yeah. thank you very much um, thank you very much for having me on Ruth I've really enjoyed our chat it's really lovely to meet you I think you're doing great work in in the in in in, in the uh the, what is it the, the inter internet world with with this kind of stuff it's really important and, and fascinating i think that um uh you know that we can connect on the other side of the world and talk about these things no and thank you so much and i hope people will find this interesting and um yeah thank you thank you making the time to do it different time zones so i think it's quite late in the evening for you and early in the morning for me <laughs> Thank yeah. you, Lars. It's been a pleasure. Brilliant. Thank you.